honor the board workshop. First item on the agenda is the um, first reading of policy number 7430, school safety plans and teams. I'm going to say, but does anyone have any questions or comments on this? Um, at the uh, policy meeting, after, after, first of all, after the, the tragedy in, in Newtown, Connecticut, um, immediately the board went to our policy to see what was currently in place, and um, it really didn't have a whole lot to do with um, safety per se um, as to the, the issues that had happened at, at uh, in Newtown, Connecticut. So I went to the policy committee and we asked for a recommendation um, from New York State School Boards Association as to something that we could put in place uh, for policy that would address some of the issues um, regarding um, <coughs> into, into buildings. So this is the first reading of that policy, um, and it will be adopted next week uh, by the board's approval, um, if they so choose um, to be in place henceforth. Um, in the meantime, we had security guards uh, in place in the elementary buildings from right before we went out into uh, onto vacation for the holidays. In December and they were in place until the January 22nd meeting of the board workshop so the special meeting left them in place for the rest of the year since um, we last met at a board meeting when we talked about having a plan in place and where are we going forward with school safety we have looked at our policy we have instituted the security guards for the rest of the year and further discussion will be had at our budget workshops as we look to see um, the money and, and what cuts and whatnot are going to have to be made. The governor um, also during this couple period of, uh, period of a couple of weeks has signed a gun bill and part of the gun bill for schools was additional um, aid, foundation aid, um, if you've got a capital project and you want to use it for um, installing hard doors, security cameras, um, swipe card systems, they will get, the state will give you an extra 10% on your building aid. So, um, for example, if we're at 72% reimbursable aid, for those items we would get an additional 10% and be at 82%. So we discovered that we really needed to look at the district as a whole with our district emergency response team, with our architects, with our project managers, with our technology people, um, with our security people, with um, Mr. John Young, with, with many different people to look at the overall safety and security of our buildings as far as intruders are concerned moving <coughs> forward. So the guards are put back in place through the end of the year, but I want everyone to know that it's a continued discussion as we bring all of these different people together and we look at the safest and most efficient way to deliver security to our buildings, to our staff, to our children, and to the district as a whole against intruders. So that's the direction and we'll continue to discuss this openly and publicly as we continue um, our discussions with where we go um, as we continue as well as it being part of our budget workshop discussions. Yes. <coughs> uh, yes. Uh, this uh, we, one of the things I noticed was I was reading through the policy um, and I'm not sure if we need it or not but I think we do uh, is a spokesperson uh, in the event that something transpires uh, that we have one central person that is talking to the press. 
that gentleman right at the end of the table. <laughs> that doesn't include everything. For example, if we're talking here, as we are talking here, about safety in the schools, then I would have some people from the dirt team that would also be spokesmen along with me on the safety issues that we have to face and the plans that we have in the future. Yeah. I was thinking more of something transpired and we do have to have a spokesperson. And, you know, just... Well, yeah, you're talking about an incident taking place. Yeah, an incident. That's and, me. Uh, yeah. yeah, that's yes. you. Mr. Pizzo, the superintendent is the man. But I think we should put that in that policy. <laughs> 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 so. I believe, uh, we'll double check uh, Mr. Woodhull, but I believe our policy um, regarding speaking to the media has that in it, um, that he's okay. a spokesperson. But we'll verify that. Yeah, I just did, yeah, being safe. resolution to approve the school and library budget vote slash election calendar and the designation of the polling places for the May 21st, 2013 vote. Questions or comments with this? Next item on the agenda from the superintendent. Thank you, Madam President. This evening we have with us our district librarians. Uh, we tried to get them in here a few times uh, last spring, and uh, we were so busy that it didn't work out. So uh, we waited breathlessly for your return <laughs> here this year. And I'll turn the program over to Mr. Steve Jensen. Thank you for uh, giving us the opportunity tonight to talk. Um, we were trying to find the correct forum to do this. We, we thought about doing it at the curriculum committee and some other committees of the board. But really, when we began to look at our library program, we began to understand that really it was about the whole school and the impact that librarians have upon the entire culture of a building. And so um, I'm going to turn this over, at my comments are brief, and turn it over to Kathy Gilligan, who uh, will then present uh, the librarians at all the great levels. Thank you. Good evening. My name is Catherine Gilligan, and I am the school library, school library media specialist at Bales Gate. I'm also the district facilitator for the Newburgh and Large City School District. We are very honored to be part of this meeting tonight and share some information with you about our curriculum and our uh, library programs. Three years ago, I was part of a committee that worked on creating a new curriculum for 21st century learners. And much has happened in the three years since we created the curriculum, and we are now in the process of making it better, including more things, and changing it to meet the needs of our students. We recently received from the Orange Ulster BOCES School Library System uh, the Empire State Information Fluency Continuum, and this is a wonderful resource of information. Um, it will just make our program that much better and help us to do a better job teaching all of our students. Um, we are going to be um, speaking um, on an elementary point of view and um, a middle school point of view and a high school point of view. And um, some of the things that we do um, from day to day on a day-to-day -day basis, we have included in the notebook. There are five sections. The first section, um, our brochures, and they tell about special programs that we have in our libraries, tell about some of the librarians. The second section is um, about research findings that show why libraries are vital and why they should be included in all schools in our district. The third binder section um, is the current kindergarten through 12th grade curriculum. And the fourth section is the 2020 vision and plan from the New York State Education Department. It has wonderful information for public libraries and school libraries. And the final section are some examples of 
our library web pages, and that's what our students would see when they go on to the um, particular websites from our schools. And that's something that we've been working on for two years. Okay, Roberta's going to talk a bit now about elementary. Good evening. My name is Roberta Farris. I'm the librarian at Gardner Town School. I'm here tonight to tell you how the teacher librarian <coughs> play an integral part in the instructional process at the elementary level. The elementary library is an inviting, learning conducive area for reading, research, and teaching activities. This safe place is designed to facilitate learning and every student's educational experience. Our strong library programs give our students the best chance to succeed. Students are encouraged and engaged by the library teacher in reading for understanding and enjoyment. We spend a good part of the day searching for that just right book. And the look on their faces when they find something special just says it all. Credential school librarians play critical roles in furthering informational fact-based literacy skills. This is one of the most profound shifts of the Common Core curriculum standards. No longer are school libraries just for books. They have become school library media centers with computer resources that enable children to engage meaningful with a wide variety of information. Our libraries on any given day are filled with eager learners enjoying themselves, and this is what we want for our children. The elementary librarians in Newburgh support the New York State Learning Standards and play a key role in the Common Core Learning Standards. The English Language Arts Standards, as you know, focus on reading to learn with informational and imaginative texts and literature. Elementary librarians are the experts when it comes to nonfiction materials. Teachers look to us for their supplies and materials. We are also the resource for videos, DVDs, online databases, and other electronic resources. When you think about it, a school library is really like a second classroom for both teachers and students. I'd like to briefly share some of the wonderful things happening in our elementary libraries. The Horizon on the Hudson Librarian, librarian is partnering with the Newburgh Free Library involving an author study. At Temple Hill, a K-3 reading, family reading night is being planned. The librarian at Forster Town works with fifth graders doing research. And the New Windsor Library <coughs> is doing a sharing with kindergarten and first grade readers. At Vail's Great, many interesting book clubs are available to all the students. Barn account, I'm very proud of our Scholastic Reading Counts program. This independent comprehensive reading program is a big component in our school. <coughs> Gardner Town School has come. Gardner Town School has come off the accountability list, and I believe that this program has improved our students' level of comprehension because it supports the shift regarding the staircase of complexity. It trains our readers to pay close attention attention to the text. As you can see, some exciting activities are happening in our school school libraries, and I invite you all, please come and see them. I leave you with this quote from the U.S. National Commission on Libraries and Information Science. Across the United States, research has shown that students in schools with good school libraries learn more, get better grades, and score higher on standardized test scores than their peers in schools without libraries. Libraries are the hub of the school, the place where many kids want to go at recess time. Isn't that wonderful? And now I'd like to introduce Ms. Ada Escalat, and she's going to talk about what goes on in the middle school library. Thank you. Good evening. My name is Ada Escalat, and I'm the librarian at Heritage Middle School. Um, I'm going to talk to you about <coughs> what we do at the middle school level. At the middle school level, we um, expand <coughs> what's happening at the elementary level with um, a more focus on technology and teaching the students to be social and um, media savvy. Uh, we make sure that this year the common core is really important. Um, at all levels in middle school, the students are exposed to um, the same type of language because with the common core there's a change in language of um, how things are referred. So that's um, one of the ways we do that. 
students come in all at, at all media um, middle school libraries, the students are scheduled differently. Um, so that we take into consideration. For the most part, most of them see the sixth grade, and one of the shifts that happened was that technology became important. We are starting to hand out the iPads, <coughs> so the librarians have become really important in um, being troubleshooting along with um, the teacher that is also the core teacher. Um, teaching them different apps and different sites and websites that they can go to to enhance the curriculum that they're being taught. Um, we are specialists in evaluating information and analyzing information and in finding and accessing information. Again, something that every student has to learn how to do properly. And again, we make sure that we support every core subject as well as other related arts at the middle school level. Um, we work with students and faculty in planning, in executing lessons, as well as in grading and um, talking amongst each other as what worked and what didn't work. Um, every library has a different uh, culture in the middle school, so we provide um, culture-specific reading materials for them, as well as um, a wide variety of materials so that they can not only enjoy what uh, they like to, for example, at, at Heritage, we have a forensics house. So a lot of the materials that we order in the nonfiction section is in forensics. Whereas um, at Temple Hill, they have different um, a different culture of what they focus on because of the magnet schools. So we make sure that whatever our houses in our schools um, need, those resources are available to them. So that's what I mean by um, culture specific. Um, we also do a lot of interlibrary loans amongst ourselves. I know this year it has increased immensely um, and the students uh, are constantly asking us to order um, different materials for them. Uh, we continue to provide opportunities for safe internet use as well as um, academic and social research um, technology act and activities. Um, we focus on creating responsible and digital and global citizen. <coughs> so basically, that's what we're doing at the middle school level, is expanding what happens at the elementary and um, preparing them for the high school and the level of rigor that they're going to have to face there when it comes to research and technology. So with that, I'm going to introduce you to Pamela Shumbry, the librarian at NFA North. OK, thanks. I'm going to have a little fun with you guys in this room, hopefully. Uh -huh. This is kind of how I teach. And since you've been bombarded with SLOs and APPRs for the past year or so, I'm going to give you a pre-assessment. <laughs> it's an interactive pre-assessment. I want to go for the highly effective four. So I'm going to kind of make answer honestly. Because if you don't give me honest answers, I can't really help you learn. Okay. Answer the, the following answer. Did you know that Wikipedia allows no original research in its entries? Go ahead, call it out. Some of them are no. 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 <laughs> Number two, did you know that some websites <coughs> drag your profile online so personal information about you can be made available to the public without your consent or knowledge? Yes. 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 We yeah. know that. <laughs> <laughs> Number three, did you know that yeah, some... Yeah, I am. You got to be able to plug it in. <laughs> Number three, did you know that some colleges and employers search the internet to see what digital oh, yeah. footprints yes. you've made and yeah. make decisions about you based on what they find? Oh, yes. yes. Oh, yeah. Number four, did you know that what you post on a social network is now admissible in court and is considered public information? Yes. Good. Did you know that any person with internet access can create a website, upload content, then have it hosted and available online for free? As long as you want to have some advertisers put stuff on your website, yeah, you can have everything done for free. Do you know how to find out who sponsors a website? No. Did you know that the KKK sponsors a website that claims to be a true historical examination of Martin Luther King? Yeah. Wow. Oh, that's hard. Our kids do. 
You know why? Because we teach them that in the high school when they do their initial research in ninth grade. We teach them how to find out who actually authored and paid for a website. And if you find out that a KKK organization is putting money into something about Martin Luther King, what does that tell you? That's evaluation of authentic, uh, bias and authenticity and those kinds of things that they need to know because, as you know, everything today is online. When they're going to do research, they're not doing it through books anymore where it had an editor and it was approved and had references. So every bit of information is accessible at the touch of a keypad. And this is the critical reason why our names got changed from librarian to library media specialists. When the World Wide Web became an internet reality, it was about 1989, it only took seven, like 15 years for 7 billion people to have access to it. Back when the book was made, it was like 1,500 years before people actually had it. <laughs> <laughs> it's a time that just now, it's just like, boom, those kids have everything at their fingertips, right? But in general, most people on the grand scale, they're not really that skilled at using the internet to call information. That resource is available, but they don't understand how to effectively navigate it. So this is one major part of a media specialist's job. It can't be taken lightly. We do consider ourselves learning specialists, and for that reason, we just see the educational world differently than a classroom teacher. They might be experts at content, but we're experts at disseminating information. So we're providing the means to find, use, and share information, and teaching kids how to do that in a smart way, so they're not just bombarded with everything they see as soon as they click a button. With the dawn of the internet, computer automation, databases, all that, we feel as media specialists we're at the helm of the true information age. Books still exist and they are still used by our students, but information access continues to change. So with the changes, there are so many components to think about. And in our work, we constantly think about freedom and access and control. So the balance has only come about as we network and we train each other as well as our users and each year poses new opportunities and new challenges. So we hope that you feel as confident as we do that the Newburgh students are preparing themselves for these changes and challenges, and we continue to try to grow as digital learners in the 21st century. With that little bit of information, next part of the old SLOs, I have to see how you guys absorb that information. <laughs> that's you again. I wanted to know, on behalf of all the librarians, if there are any questions that are in your mind now that we're kind of open to try to uh, answer. And, um, because I'm the last presentation of the library group. So <laughs> <laughs> you direct them at me or anyone in the room if you want. Or if you want to write things down and get back to us, we can do that too. We want to thank you for your time and giving us a forum for this. Thank you. Okay, that sounds good. The emailing questions, fantastic. Does anyone have any questions or comments for the library media specialist? <laughs> Yes, Mrs. McAfee. On behalf of the library committee, I, I would like to thank them for educating us. Yes. Uh, I, I think you probably saw that the modern library is a different place yeah. than the one you went to when you were in school. <laughs> yeah. uh, and and it, it's nice, I think, for us to get an idea of, of how far things have come and, and the change uh, that, that has really been brought about. and how important then the, the school libraries are to the entire school activity. All of the instruction that goes on you know, is tied in one way or another to that school library. Yes, Mr. Lawson. Do we decimal systems? <laughs> 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 this is the most ironic part. Yes. <laughs> well, you don't what? have like I the card catalog. No, we have online. We still need a way to classify and organize the book. But here's the, the, the killer: is yeah, we have it in the public libraries, have it, and then they go to college, and it's the LC, it's, it's the yeah, Library yeah, of Congress yeah. system, is completely different. I want to speak to that for a second. When I, when I, when I, teach, when I teach the Dewey Decimal System, I the way I teach my, especially the second and third graders, I say, this is the way Melville Dewey <laughs> designed it over 100 years ago. And isn't it amazing that you can go to the Newburgh Free Library and the numbers are exactly the same. You can go to a library in Texas and the numbers are exactly the same. You can go to a library in Florida and then the numbers are exactly the same. And they're blown away by that. Good <laughs> question. Yes, but just proof Ed, <laughs> that, that things have to continue to change mm -hmm. is that our high school library, at the very least, will have to be changing because when our students leave NFA and go to college, 
they're not going to be using the Dewey Decimal System. <laughs> and if we truly want them to be ready, uh, then we need to introduce the Library of Congress system. To them. So at some point, we may want to change our libraries over. <laughs> they, they don't even do research, do. We, do research. we do research MLA style, and then they get to college and they do an APA style. Yeah, sure. So you figure out things in, as you go along. But what we try to do, I think, is just give them a foundation. What is research on fettered curiosity that you're going and exploring more about something that you don't know about? But try to lay a foundation. Mr. Jensen? I just wanted to, to share, like, with, with the Common Core, at the core of the Common Core is literacy. And these individuals come with a skill set that not only help students, but they help teachers as well. And, and I have to say that I've worked with the, this group of individuals for, what, three, four years now. And they have taught me a ton more than I've ever taught them or shared with them. And I've learned more about literacy and, and student comprehension and fluency from this group of individuals who also not only have to stay current with their craft, but also it, what their craft is, is changing all the time, as they've talked about. And they have really shown that they have taken their per, their profession seriously, and they perform it with fidelity and with rigor. And I'm very proud of this group of people. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. <laughs>
with the uh, form, they, they agreed to pay the $325 for the custodial fees and determine the custodial fees tomorrow. They have the insurance, they have all the requirements on file with us. Okay, go ahead, go okay. back, Mr. Pizzo. In the excitement of the moment, I skipped B, but we're going to go back to it. I want you to think we're trying to cut the meeting short here, stretch your imagination. <laughs> Resolution B is to approve facilities project change orders associated with the approved project. The Vales Gate renovation project, one and two. Gardner Town renovation project. The NFA North renovation project as well. Friday, we'll be getting the monthly uh, binder of construction information um, for your review before Tuesday's meeting, and Mr. Damon will be present for um, questions on Tuesday the 29th as well. That ends this session for this evening, Madam President. Thank you, Mr. Pizzo. Next item on the agenda is from the Assistant Superintendent for Student Intervention and Support Services. Thank you, Madam President. Um, in your packet, there is um, a, a quick uh, set of materials. And um, the first, the top document uh, is a, a document that says CSE recommendations. We are going to send a replacement, revised and approved um, which is the one that <coughs> responds better to the remaining remaining documentation that, that is in the packet.
but it's not for approval, it's FYI. Um, the other documents are the ones for the board approval. And we started sending the thick packages the last time. <coughs> so um, the um, documents that we just sent around to replace the prior one pager or three pager that was mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Uh, portrait. And that's landscape. And <coughs> under number one, oh, we call that because we have discussed this at Cabinet also how to make it <coughs> the clearest for the board. Um, that the first one is the special education summary report. And number one is the number of students newly classified. Under that heading, there are four subheadings, <coughs> which are easily cross-referenced to the two lists. So if you would like to know, well, um, <coughs> where are the students uh, in the preschool area who were newly classified? You can then look for initial, requested, requested, and transferred. And the sum total of those decisions in this document will equal the 18. That's there. So for this month of December, we have 18 newly classified students. And the reason we are doing that is that the, the board would want to kind of familiarize itself with the various decisions made by the CSEs. So the 18 <coughs> is the sum of those four headings on the CSEC report. Then <coughs> where it says school age, CSE 36, in the second listing, there are also similar headings. <coughs> the initial request to be <coughs> requested and transferred. And <coughs> they total 36. So those are the initial reviews for the month. I mean, for the, the, those are the newly classified students for the month. And then this is that they were classified. And then the thicker documents are actually what services are to be to delivered to those each individual student. Yes. And so for each one of the actions, or for each of the ID members on the right-hand side, in each, in, in either, on either report, there is going to be a one-pager. Okay. This time, <coughs> the, the listing of the ID <coughs> members on the right doesn't totally <coughs> correspond to the, the, the order because IP direct alphabetizes them. Okay. And it doesn't do it by number. However, there is an easy way to find out which ones they are because at the top of the, each page, Sorry. you see that there is a request to review, etc. There's no way to sort by ID number as opposed to alphabetical? There must be a way, but we would have to yeah, and we'll do that. Because you know, you're right. I mean, it is easy, but it would be even easier yes. if it went in this order. Then that is oh, I see. Or if these could be reorganized to go this way. To match. Right. Or right. Yeah, yeah, right. One or the other. Right. This okay. could be done alphabetically, that but just so they're either both done alphabetically or they're both done according to ID number in, you know, in order. And I realized that late, so there, there was That's okay. time to read. Mr. Lawson. Uh, I just had a question. Um, I don't know what the <coughs> educational setting, but, you know, called HIPAA in the medical setting. Um, I noticed that in the participants section, it does have some individual's names. It should not be there. It should not be there. I just wanted to make sure. I think in the educational setting, it's the Family Educational Rights and Privacy Act. That's your acronym. <laughs> I'm going to dig that up. I have a list of acronyms around Mr. Lawson. I'm going to dig that up for all of us, actually. But I just didn't want us to be in violation yes. of FERPA. 
Maybe we will so do it next time that we that because right. it wasn't there before. Yeah, a couple of things. One, um, I, I think David said something in reference to the fact that, that there will perhaps be a proposal about this at the next meeting. A resolution. A resolution. Um, I, I wonder if we shouldn't wait for the incoming. No, we should do them at the next meeting. We have to do them because otherwise the kids aren't going to get their services. It's really arranging for the placement, Doc, not right. approving. Okay, but it's the format that I was. Oh, that format is. Yeah. So I think working on it now is fine, but I think perhaps it might be better to wait uh, to, to actually make a decision. Oh, on the format. Right. Well, on that's the format why I care when, when the new assistant superintendent <laughs> or special education comes in. Um, and then I had a question about the preschool back on, on the front page yes. uh, as opposed to school age. Is preschool only the universal pre-K? Are, or could this be um, a two-year-old or a three-year-old in the community? Yes. Um, so do we know how many children are, are screened? In other words, that number uh, is, is, the seven is out of potentially CPS how many kids? Because I think that would be interesting to know. Yeah, I guess it's three and four-year-olds, but still. Okay. Uh -huh. So I think, I think it would be three, I was talking to Margo, because birth to three through the county would be, you know, newborn infant through three years old. And then pre-K would be the three and four year olds are not kindergarten age. So it would be those students, but not necessarily only the kids in our universal pre-K program. Right. Any child that age that lives in the district. So the parents could <laughs> recognize, you know, that there was a problem, you know, uh, and with their position or whatever, they, they, would, they would start the process. Because I was just curious about numbers. In other words, we're looking at, at a given number of, of students newly classified, um, but out of out of how many? I, I was I was very interested. Right, like what would the census be of how many preschool age children we have in the district? Is what you're saying. <coughs> right, and then we've got this also this number out there in in the community, and then the school age, you know, only one in September, but out of 11,000 something, right? Mm -hmm. And that was because the teachers had not yet been able to identify needs and, and started that process. Now, because when you go over to the next page, it, it very clearly talks about the total number of students with disabilities in the district. But the 1744 is out of the 11,000 uh, so I'm trying to get a handle on, on percentages of them. Yes, Mr. Pacella. If you look at the history of our scoreboard and our incoming fifth, uh, kindergartner, uh, kindergarten grades, mm -hmm. we typically take in roughly 900 students at the kindergarten level. So if you were to apply, because we also have almost 1,000 in each grade. Right. So if you were to apply <coughs> that number 900 for each age, you could probably gauge what that comes to. So okay. you, you figure on 900 times three or four. Okay. So about 3,600. Yeah. I, I think it gives us a better perspective if we think of it that way, mm -hmm. rather than just, oh, we only had one. Right. Yeah. Right. right. Well, <laughs> if you take into account the total number of possibles and the time of year, mm -hmm. um, that makes a huge difference. Mr. Levis. Um, on the first page here, number five, it was added and explained some of the discrepancy of, of where you know the numbers didn't line up. So, eight, over four months, 83 kids were um, exited. The kids with disabilities exited in the MCS. What does that mean? What what did they do to exit? Uh, some of them. Some of them. I mean, it wasn't declassified because that would have been in a different line. Mm -hmm. right. Well, some of them left the district for other districts. Some of them went to GD. Some of them left the country. Uh, a couple of them, several, are still in our district, but the fewest. And uh, some of them just dropped out or were dropped out because of long-term absence. So after 20 days, they hadn't shown up 
so they, they were dropped out. And um, uh, let's say some uh, were dropped by the parents, few, several, couple were transferred to other uh, locations by the court. And uh, in that member, in that member, I not included those students who are still in the district, who you know, remain in the district, who, who could have left but either didn't or returned. So over the four months, yeah, we had that member leaving the district. Are most of them moved out of the district? Is that what the basic is? A large number. There's 83, 83 that or exited. The students with disabilities exiting. Did they drop out? Did they? Did they move? Well, in October, for instance, we have uh, one ED. We have uh, three twenty. They drop. That's automatically dropped because they haven't shown up in twenty days. It's not automatic. You have to send a letter first. I was, I, was, I was about to ask a question about that. Don't automatically drop. Right, okay. But, okay. So those those are dropped by, by the district with a letter. Uh, a couple uh, went to another uh, location because of the court. As a matter of fact, three of them did. Um, four. Uh, several went to... <coughs> who one went to the country of Mexico. One, two, three, four, five, no. uh, in, in December, for instance, we had non-attendance, 20 day drop, a couple self-withdrew, Connecticut, withdrawn by the parents, one uh, home instruction, but by court placement, or through court placement. Puerto Rico, Florida, another school district. Uh, Albany, Cornwall, transferred by the courts. Went to other schools. Okay, so most of them are resolved to other schools. Okay. Yes. Yeah. <laughs> All right, and, and another question I had on, on this is just in, in general. The evaluators, their evaluators are listed on here, and they make, make recommendations uh, um, of the students' progress and maybe what they might need. And some of them are employees, and some of them, I think, are <coughs> private individuals or firms that do this. And then I believe that some of them may be the vendors that, that district contracts with to supply those services. So. My question, I guess, and I don't know if you have to look into it or if, if you even think it's worthwhile to, are some of these evaluators making the recommendations and then the ones that we're paying to do what they recommend? Mm. I, I don't know. I, I, I'm looking at the, the names and stuff, and I, I think there might be there. And I don't know if that's something that I should look into. Some, 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 uh, uh, the team members are probably people who have uh, conducted an assisted, assisted technology evaluation and they go to the meeting to explain the reasons why they, rec they recommended a certain type of uh, technology. Uh, others could be uh, people who conducted evaluations if there were independent evaluations asked for by the parents. Others could be OTPT speech language. Uh, I understand that we, we need to have the <coughs> evaluators to make decisions, but if, if the evaluators are the ones that are going to profit from from their recommendations, I, I don't know if that's something that... Although they make know. recommendations, but the CSE is the one who makes Mr. the determination Mr. based upon the documentation, and they're not the only individuals who weigh in on the process. No, I, I, yeah. I realize that. I realize there's a list, and some of them are employees, and, 
and, and I'm hoping that all are impartial and, and they wouldn't recommend something to benefit themselves. But I'm just, I don't know by the names in the firms whether <coughs> that is the case or not. Mr. Lawson. Um, I, I, I wanted, um, Dr. Noriega brought up something about the drop. I, I, I think I'd like to make sure that we are not dropping students. We went through a, a big thing at the policy committee about the policy of parental neglect and, and referrals for educational neglect. Um, and if we have that policy in place, we really should be going through a process before we just drop a student before after 20 days. So I, I want to make sure that that's not what's going on. Mm -hmm. um, and secondly, right, but you know, <laughs> I just want to make sure that, that we are actually doing what we're, what we're doing. Um, and the second thing is, typically, um, a lot of uh, students in special education do not have insurance. And I'd like to make a referral to uh, Madam President. There's a, there's a funding source out there um, for students without health insurance to be given health insurance. It's a, it's a grant, I think, it's from, ranging from 250 a year to a million dollars a year, that we actually try to pursue that. Because I would assume that most of our students do not have health insurance coverage because um, that's the nation's usual average. Like a lot of the students that are in special education <coughs> typically don't have it. It's an indicator. So I want, I, I'm not going to ask any, any research to be done. I think we should just, you know, try to, to explore that opportunity. But I do know um, a lot of, of our staff that works with our families, particularly the psychologists, the social workers, and also Mrs. Peterson, um, are constantly giving referrals and resources because there's a lot out there for children under the age of 18 who do not have health care. So they're always being, um, I'll say, provided information about resources around that. Um, as far as any grants, um, that would have to go through the superintendent because there's a whole process for grants and whether we're even eligible as a district to put in for particular grants. So it's not our place as a board to say, you know, I want you to go after this grant, but certainly we can make the recommendation to the superintendent, um, you know, can, can we investigate if this is something that we even qualify for. Um, you know, moving forward. But I, I do want you to know that um, we do have staff that is constantly referring our families and sharing resources with them, particularly around health insurance um, for those families that don't have, because there's a lot of free health insurance out there for children under the age of 18. Well, this, this particular grant is specifically designed for school district. And um, in fact, uh, I think we just had a parent meeting Yesterday, Mrs. Peterson had, and, and she was, again, sharing information about some opportunities, but even the people that were sharing the Terrell Infancy um, Services Service Network, Network yeah. didn't know about this funding source. And it's a, this, is a, this is a funding source that you get, you get paid to just get people registered. It's like it's money in the bank. So I will share it with Mr. Peterson. Thank and, you. Um, I'm just going to read questions. <coughs> <clears throat> you get that information to me, we'll follow up on it. Thank you. Thank you. Any other questions for Dr. Maria? Uh, on the back of the page is the, the usual information that we provided also. And then, um, the documents that talks about the suspension information. Categories. 
not all of them, but many of them, and uh, where the incidents uh, correspond to those categories. There is still one that says other out of district, no reason available, and 14 of those uh, because those are students who are attending out of district placements and uh, we uh, are not able yet to do the uh, correlation between the reasons and being able to put that data on our mainframe on the mainframe campus. But that probably will be easily done. But those 14, they're not in our district schools. They're, they're, they were provided at another school because it didn't, it didn't work well here. And I guess it's not working well there. It, I mean, the only thing I, I, I would be interested in is, is it 14 kids or is it three kids that have 14 incidents? Those you know, are incidents. Those are incidents. incidents. So we don't know how many children it could it could be one, it could be 14. Be 14 one to 14. Know. We know it's between right. one and 14. <coughs> so basically, out of the 49 incidents the month of December, only 35 <coughs> were incidents within our district <coughs> because 14 were done outside the district. That, that's a significant number, too. Mr. Lawson. Yeah, and, and I think one of the reasons why we wanted to get the description was to find out of what category, and what was the reason for the suspensions. <coughs> and one thing that's <coughs> clearly obvious is, is that it's not <coughs> the assaultive type of behavior right. that we were talking about. Right. Which, um, and, and, and I think we need to really flesh out this other thing, even though it's outside of the district, it, because this, this other thing is puts us in a bad category. We, it's not assaultive, it's not, um, not even drug related. I think what, there's one drug offense, it's, there's no weapons offenses, so. Is the, it all insubordination well, or? The, the, you the know. largest number besides the out of district one is insubordination. Mm -hmm. And so we're back to kind of square one with mm -hmm. this thing. What are the other, what are the other others? Right. Well, what is it that they're doing? Um, yes, Ms. Prokash. But if you even, but if you take, um, well, I'm just going by the incidents on the back, um, Mr. Wilson. If you take the things that are like the physical assault, the bullying, uh, drug, um, intimidation, bullying, the theft, lewd behavior, uh, hearing officer, truancy, you, you're coming up with a large number there too, so that drops it even further as far as incidents that could be in question of why we're suspending or why. It brings it down even further. So <coughs> that's probably 20 or 19, if you, if you count all those other ones up, you know what I'm saying? No, no I, I guess because the conversation, you remember the conversation. Yes, yes. And it was about assaultive and weapon. Right. But I mean, yeah. assaultive and weapon, they shouldn't even, it is an assault, a weapon, they shouldn't be, they should be out, in my mind, a whole year. But I mean, if you have, other incidents like bullying and intimidation, that's to me is a serious offense. You have theft or lewd behavior, that's another one. They, you know, so, so there is, so it's not just insubordination or other, you know what I'm saying? Well, the, which is the less offensive, I think you, you were saying. Yeah, no, um, so I mean, I guess my point was we were specifically looking at, because we didn't have all of these details before, right. so we were specifically looking at assault and weapons. Because those were out, and drugs, right. those were out. They, they were, were not out. going to be considered. Right. That's my only thing. Right. And, and so what we have now is an idea that right. most of the issues are not drug, and are not weapons, and are not assault of behavior. So, so, ha so how do we address the issue of suspensions yes. since most of right. them are not drugs, weapons, right. assault? Right. And we also have a differential between in school and out of school suspensions right. here too. Right. So some of these on the back are in school suspensions, not out of school. But we also learned from that conversation that it doesn't matter. It doesn't matter. It doesn't matter when it comes to a lawyer. 
but it matters to me when it comes to if you're in in-school suspension with a program and you're getting you're getting five hours whole of education, of all day of education mm -hmm. instruction. Mm -hmm. That to me, even though we're saying it's it's suspension out of the classroom, they're in school. Not so it's, it, compared I, to out of school where they're only getting a few hours. I, I, you know what I'm saying? I, I, I get it. On that, I get it, but because I think a lot of times I, when interrupt, a lot of times students that were in my in school suspension program got an education each and every day of a full day of education. Mm -hmm. And they didn't get, they, 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 they went back to their class not behind, but, you know, equal, mm -hmm. or they've even gotten some more work done. So it's, you know, they're, they're getting basically an education in school that's run right. But, but I think, what, right, right. And I think also, and Mr. Lawson, obviously, <laughs> you can speak for yourself, but you're still, at the end of the day, it's still a suspension. And if we're looking to reduce referrals slash suspensions, right, whether they're in school or out of school, I think that's what you're speaking yeah, to. And, and, and I think that's what we learned the other day. And, and, and I, because I don't disagree right. with this comment, right. but, right. but I don't think that this comment gets us to where we really want to go. Right. You know, right. Right. I'd like to see it do great. I'd like to see the in-school suspension be great. But it still doesn't, I guess, right. ultimate, the Ultimately, it's to eliminate suspensions, whether right. they be in school or out of school. Right. Can yes. I just ask a question? Mm -hmm. If there's a removal by a hearing officer, there's got to be an underlying reason for the removal, and it shouldn't just say removal by hearing officer. The student <laughs> should have, been, have done something that's you know, significant. <laughs> so I don't understand that. That would be part of one of these categories. If it's right. Assuming, right. Assuming, right. Assuming, right. Yeah. Yeah. I guess the assumption is that if it's a hearing officer removal, it's pretty serious. But there should be the underlying right. reason right. for yeah. it, whether right. it was an assault, whether it was something else. Yeah, if it escalated. Right. Exactly. So, right. Because yeah. that's an incident. This is not a reason. You know, that's not a, a reportable reason. Yeah. But they're, they're not included, Dr. Noriega, in. Like, if it's a removal by hearing officer, is, is that incident also included in one of these other, where it yeah. says assault one, disorderly conduct one, or? It is not. It is not. It is not. Okay, so it's there's totally separate. So there's, so there's totally separate reasons for those yes. four, and we're going to assume that they're pretty serious if the hearing yeah. officer. And following up on Margaret's comment, uh, if, uh, if, uh, looking at the table on the other side of the, of the page in the first. Two of those I know correspond to the 121 and 127 at the bottom, where it says um, 121 days, 127 days. And, and the hearing officer removes when there is a, uh, a hearing, and then they think that there is a need to They, suspend. they, they so recommend days. suspension. They don't suspend. They just recommend. Okay. Yeah, and, and, and they recommend that the suspension be for 121 days or 127 days. So they add to the five days a number of days uh, as the result of the year. So those are probably would correspond to the 121, 27, the 45, and the 25 days. other out of district is 11, is 11 students. So 14, 14 incidents students. involving 11 different students. Yes. Mr. Levenstein? Well, that's what I was looking at on the other side. So, so is that ulster boces and orange ulster boces? Is that that's where it came from? Okay, so so again, those 14 suspensions that, that they did, um, those are full-time students in, in those schools? And, but it's a, but when the data comes back, how many children the, the Newburgh school district suspended? That 14 gets put on our column. Is that correct? Because there are kids, even though it's at a district placement, there are kids. 
So, so we, we have no control have that no control. they are saying that they need to be suspended, but yes, it gets counted against them. And what I have seen, um, the information related to the suspensions has to do with bus uh, misbehavior or things of that, that nature. Not serious. That where maybe we wouldn't have suspended them is what my point is. I, I don't know. Or we might have suspended them also for one or two days, depending on the events. These students are usually not the best for the longer trips that our kids are in the district. They're going out to Goshen, they send them to Chester, and there's other sites around the county that they go to. And they do get a bit difficult to be on the bus. It's a long trip. <coughs> There's also a difference between, I think this is what you're going to say, Mike, there's a difference between being suspended off the bus and in school or out of school suspension, correct, Mr. Cassell? There is that difference, but that's not what I was going to say. Okay. Most of these offenses on the bus deal with assault because they're, it's mostly fighting or uh, actually attacking of the, the aid that's on there. But some of these students are behavioral okay. students that have issues. Okay, so it's rightfully so suspension. Yeah. Yeah, I, well, I, I can't answer for what they do at the school. I can't have them on the bus because they're jeopardizing the other students. Oh, well, of course. Uh, of course. So my, my decision to remove them from the bus usually deals with some sort of assault fight or something so egregious that they just can't be on the bus. For a so time. is that then our responsibility to get them to the school or parents? To it's, get them to Goshen? New York State's clear. It's, it's the parents' responsibility, and then the attorneys will say, unless it's, uh, uh, it's, it's um, or tantamount to their education, in other words. Unless it's tantamount to a suspension from school. Right. So, so what have we done, though, when you're saying if it's a I suspended them, and if they, the bus. that's correct, and if they call up and say, I have no way of getting them to the school, then I contact the state to find out what I need to, to do, what my obligations are in terms of asking for some sort of justification. Home instruction. Otherwise, you'd have 400 cabs. So, so let me ask you this to be clear. If a child is suspended off of the school bus, does that come out on a, I know this is, we're just talking here with students with disabilities, but a student in the Newburgh Large City School District is suspended off the bus, loses that privilege. Does that go down as a suspension? No. I'm not suspended from school. I don't suspend from school. I just tell them you lose the right, you lose this privilege of getting there. Right. Now your parents have to take it. No, I'm just trying to find, figure out for the numbers. Yeah, no, they're is, not on. So they're two, they're two separate. Although, if two students are fighting on a bus, the principal may decide that that's that enough to be suspended from school. Because right. when you think about it, if two right. students coming into school, eventually they're going to meet right. up again. Right. But if it's solely for behavior on the bus mm -hmm. and, and they're not, they're being suspended from that privilege, it doesn't go down in any district numbers as a suspension. Not okay. my part. Okay. All right. So then that, that wouldn't be there if that's the case. Correct. That, correct. That wouldn't be reason for these 14 most probably? It depends. If they got in a fight on the bus, the principal could have decided to also suspend them from school. I don't know that. It could have been, you know, third, fourth, fifth uh, problem that the kids have had. What else did you want to say, Mr. Cassell? No, no, that was it. <laughs>
authorize the superintendent of schools to execute an agreement with the Hudson Regional Information Center to purchase RTI direct services. Uh, IP direct, RTI direct is a piece of software that allows for management of the response to intervention process. It's very easy for the <coughs> And the funding source is IDA Part B Section 611. RTI would start with level one in the classroom. It, it, it will, it will allow, it's, uh, depending upon the level uh, that's given to the staff to enter info and for some staff perhaps to just look at the information that's available, read only um, information. Some staff would be able to enter the data and edit the data and others read the data. And uh, what we can do is provide uh, a little description of the, of the program and the updates. Will you try to, to, to get an answer to that question? Yes. As to who can input information? Yes. Because it just seems to me like if the classroom teacher can't uh, it'll start that process by entering um, when, when the child is first identified as needing <coughs> different instruction, then, then we're missing an important piece. Yes. So we'll find out okay. who can enter data, read, etc., and at what stage of right. the process. Otherwise, it, it wouldn't pick up until the, the child hits the committee. Resolution A is to authorize the superintendent of schools to execute an agreement to purchase microscopes for secondary science classrooms and the funding source is school district management. <coughs> Microscopes for the high school for the high school. Well, we're I mean, it's authorizing to spend over a hundred thousand yeah. dollars here, so I would hope so. But I don't know exactly how many that um, points to, but I can find out. It's in the secondary science classroom close to the district. All no, all no microscopes. Yeah. I'll find out. Mr. Woodhull. That was my question. I was trying to figure out how many. Microscopes you're getting for a hundred thousand okay. plus good microscope will run you ten thousand with no problem at all. I'll put it find it out, put it in the and and would you also check Mel to see what what they're doing with any that are being replaced? Because if, if they're still okay, then are, are we moving them into the middle school program so that we continue to get them elementary. Our elementary. Our elementary. Oh, um, this, this, I think, is, is why you know, I, I would push for things like this to come to the curriculum committee so that we could see what courses it fits into. Uh, what, what, what is, where is this part of the instructional program? This is a little plug. Daniel is back tomorrow, so I'll speak to Daniel. <laughs>
Resolution B is to authorize the superintendent to execute an agreement with Express <coughs> Incorporated. This is the software company that we use for the unit uh, plans and the lesson plans. It's an <coughs> online um, program that we've asked the teachers to use for their lesson plan. So this is the annual uh, renewal thing. <coughs> Resolution C is to approve an overnight field trip to Black Rock Bars for NFA students. This is part of the Sherpa Club, and the funding source is the Sherpa Club Student Activities and Parent Donations. Resolution D is conference request. additional uh, resolution on the table this evening. Um, it's in the package that Matthew gave you. It's item E. And this resolution is to execute an agreement with Naviance Incorporated to provide professional development. Naviance is the software package that we have for the guidance counselors. Um, and this is additional professional development um, that goes along with the software that will be provided to the guidance staff. If I remember correctly, uh, Mr. Puzo, isn't this also the program that was used when we went for the site visit to Rockland County? school in uh, Rockland County that yes. had alternative programs and they were using Naviance. Yes, they were. To, to really get the answers to, to some of the questions that we've got. So this is, I think, is his second conference that he's gone to about the middle years. And uh, you know, <coughs> what he's doing is trying to pull together the answers to, to the questions that we have, uh, particularly to see if there's a way of, of providing the training that would be required uh, in an economical way. Uh, and, and, uh, we hope that the answer is yes, but it's still very much in the exploratory stage. But in order to, to find out what we need to know, we've got to spend a little money. So that's that's what the two conferences are at this point. If we decide to go with it, of course, the, these conferences will have been money well spent. Mm -hmm. If we decide not to go with it, maybe it will have saved us a lot of money because we'll find out that the answers that he brings back are not to have, uh, are not pleasing to us. And um, some of what was presented that day included um, possible funding sources okay. moving forward um, through grants, IB grants and other um, grants and federal grants <coughs> and special state legislation. Um, they also presented information on um, how the, um, the links to the Common Core, IB and the links to the Common Core. So um, it really began to be, we need to explore more to get the answers to some questions before the board can discuss whether this is something that you know, we should move forward with okay. as a district. Okay. Thank you, Mrs. 
Next item on the agenda is from the Assistant Superintendent for Business. First item is a resolution to award the 2012-2013 Winter Athletic Transportation bid. Resolution to declare equipment and out, uh, supplies uh, obsolete and authorize their disposal. I think um, one resolution might be missing. We set the donation from a thousand to a thousand dollars from the community. I know it's not listed on the agenda. Oh. So we'll have to add yeah, that to the agenda. Um, I think the, the Windsor PTO might be separate, now, I think. Yeah, the PTO is separate. There's a $1,000 donation. It's in the uh, packet. So we'll confirm that, and then we'll confirm that and add it to the agenda for Tuesday. Madam President? Yes. Yeah. authorized payment of property tax refunds pursuant to court orders uh, for Liberty Street property and for uh, Town of Windsor residential property. Mr. Joseph uh, Asatora. Mike, on, on the previous one, is that an anonymous donation? Yeah, I think it is. Okay. I say, Mark, I'll uh, confirm and if it's anonymous. And if it, if it isn't, I'll send it out in the update. Thank you, it's not anonymous. Well, or, her, or her. We thank them anyway oh, okay. in my letter. <laughs> That's quarter. Item D is a resolution to authorize the superintendent of schools to execute an agreement with the Carol and Frank Beyond the Education Center at Leak and Watch Services Incorporated to provide educational service for the 2012-2013 school year. This is placing a particular student, and we, I don't think we've ever really, I mean, I don't remember voting on like, each student for a private placement that, that we have all, the whole agreement. Is there any reason why this is different, or is this the way we're going to be going, or is there... <laughs> I'm sorry? I said it should be approved. It should be I mean, so every private placement then should be approved like this? If there's a contract with the school to educate, the tuition contract or other contract that should be approved. Okay, but I mean, don't we do the same thing with even like BOCES? We, we have it's different. You have a COSA with them and you pay them um, based upon the services that you use, including the, um, you know, the program that you place students in. So you do ultimately <coughs> approve all of those. Okay, so but then then individual private contract, pri students that, which I would assume we have more than just this one, right. that are, are sent to a private school, not a, a BOCES, that we have a general contract with, should come before the board in this form. You've done that. Yeah, yes. yeah, we've yeah, seen that before. Yeah, individual yeah. ones? Yes. Mm -hmm. The kid's been there since July, though. Yeah. Just haven't done it in a while. Where's the proof of the mail? So what the question is, if the child's been there um, since July, why is it just coming for approval now? Tom said it's been a while since, because I, I don't remember any in a year and a half that 
th that we've approved a specific child for a specific institution. Um, no, actually, I don't know. I, I think I do remember within the last year. Yeah. Yeah. We can we, have Matthew go back and, and look um, it's through quite this a particular um, <coughs> you know, section of the agendas to see. But We'll include the uh, that explanation in the update. Great, thank you. Item E is a resolution to increase the 2012-2013 general fund from a donation to the PTO. This was to put in the new playground. Mm -hmm. For your information, <coughs> there should be another one of these coming. Um, to the board meeting, which would be in our board packet. Um, friends of the NFA crew team, the not-for-profit organization that was formed to raise the money to have an official crew team that was told they have to have the money by uh, the January board meeting has successfully raised that money. So we have to have a resolution such as these um, to accept that money for the funds <coughs> to be expended for that purpose. So that should be um, part of next week's um, items for approval. Okay, and they did so. They did so between June 26th. Um, we gave them the authority to do that, and uh, between June 26th of 2012 and December 15th of 2012. Um, they successfully raised $53,000 as a private organization. And that's something we also need to, this actually is a good time to discuss for the fencing club. Because um, the last time we discussed the fencing club, we thought that um, it would be okay to put that stipend out as a club stipend, which was the $253. But, um, the um, parties involved are not in agreement to that. So the board would have to create a resolution like we did for the crew team organization to establish a 5013C um, organization and give them the ability to fundraise the money for whatever that stipend is and the cost of that particular team, so to speak, is. So that's actually up for discussion as to um, whether that's something that the board, you know, wants to give them the ability to do. And, and if that being the case, if we created that resolution, then we could contact, um, you know, those people involved, um, and you know, then they would have they they could on their own if they wanted contact friends of the NFA crew team to see what that process is to establish a non for profit 5013C. Um, as a you know fundraising entity in order to do that because they, that group did say that they'd be willing to help any other sports or clubs that needed to do the same thing that were in danger of being cut due to um, budgetary cuts that they would be willing to help them through that process but um, they can't even go do that until we give them the approval to to establish a, this organization. Yes, Mr. Is Watson. it just because the I know that the others that are approved they have other issues they have more money to raise. I, my understanding of Q of the fencing team is that they already had all the equipment they had they were all set. It was just about the stipend. Is that not accurate? I don't know the details. I don't know if they have other expenses except the stipend. So. We've never spent anything on fencing in any budget code over the years. So it would just be the twenty-five hundred or the stipend, whatever the stipend is. So, so we need. I guess we need to research that a little bit more to see because if, if the board is going to give approval for them to do that, um, you know, they have to know. Like we had to tell um, friends of the NFA crew team the amount. 
that they would have to raise in order to for that to move forward. Well, there. I'm sorry. Yeah. So, are you saying that we never spent any money, not even the stipend, just the stipend, just the stipend? Okay. That's what I'm saying. Okay. There's no research; it's zero, except for the stipend. So, okay. So, the stipend amount, Mrs. Weimer, is it's not as high as 2,500, but it's 18, maybe 13. It's higher than that. Okay, it's higher than that. Um, I don't know the exact amount. I have to look up. So we have to look up that. Um, does, does the, Mrs. McAfee. We, we need to be careful, I think, though, because the, the, I don't really know very much about fencing, but the foils would have been purchased at some point, and I, I would imagine by us. I have no idea. They well, maybe they it was so done. long ago you just don't remember, or maybe, you know, you I got the, I'm here. I was here I'm here 20 years. I never bought an epi. I got the sense that they, they spent a lot of their own money. Right. In fact, I think that's what he's. What they, what they that was did. their point. That was their point. They said, "Look, we paid for everything. They did and, their and fundraising for everything. their equipment. They fundraised as a, as a club. Yeah. yeah. So I mean, but that's the whole thing. It was a club, and she was getting. It, it was a club. If it is a club, then it's a club stipend. But it was a club. Coach. With a coach's stipend. If it's a club, it's a club. If it's a team, it's a team. But right. then that goes back to the point Mr. Peter was making earlier, where some, some, sometimes, some case, somebody made a deal <laughs> that said, hey, you go out and get all of your equipment, we'll pay the stipend. So, so you know, legally, Margo, would it have to be a fencing team? Well, I would assume that the difference between a club and a team is competitions and what you're permitted to participate in, because that's generally been the case. So it may be something with the um, New York State Public High School Athletic Association. Which I don't believe is a recognized sport, like crew. But, but right, crew wasn't either. But crew has a schedule. Uh -huh. Crew has invitationals. I have no idea what fencing has, and if right, if you have them and you're basically endorsing them as a team, you probably have to endorse them, their schedule and all of that. Um, certainly, I, I know they're not razor sharp, but I think our insurance guys gonna have something to, to say about it. And then I don't know, will I have to cost out all of these things, and they're gonna have to fundraise for all of that? How, who's gonna pay for these events when you endorse them? Like, I don't know how much this costs. I really don't. So I can't give them a number on what to raise because I don't even know what events they go to or where they are. Mr. Lawson. And again, I think that what they were saying was just give us back our team. I, 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 think, I, I think that they wanted to just go back to whatever the deal was before, which Mike said, Mike's, Mike's saying we didn't pay them any. We didn't, we didn't expend any money. The only thing that we spent on was a stipend. They just want that back. That's what they're asking for. So Right, but the board had decided that that was going to be cut, that we weren't going to pay a stipend for a club that was a coaching stipend. That's that's what it's coming to. That's how it ended up getting eliminated. Okay, and I got so that. that's what's back on the table. So they came back and they're asking for $1,800. We offered, to, we offered to let them go back as a club, and, that, and they said that wasn't acceptable to them. So, so before us is the decision whether we want to pay eighteen hundred dollars or not. Well, why? Why is it more? If that's what they're asking. Because it wasn't what they're asking for. Mike said we never paid any. We, we never paid. I don't. No, no, no. That's the question. Equipment. He's saying. He's the question is for the, okay, the, type so, of the amount of the stipend. That's the question. Mike's gonna go here. No, I, no. So you're saying something different, Sue. He's saying the, the amount of the stipend. You're saying that the other he's, costs no, associated. he's saying zero for the amount of stipend. That's not what no, he's no. saying. No, no. No, that's not what he's saying. I'm saying we paid zero for expenses. Right. The only right. thing the district paid for was the stipend. That's right. That's it. I know that. But the but stipend you amount. You're saying that we're more money than the 1800 More than a club stipend. stipend. Yes. Oh, okay. But, so I'm. That's why it was cut. It was cut last year. No, but I, I just said, I just asked you. I said. So they're asking for us to pay eighteen hundred dollars. No, they're asking to pay for the stipend. The stipend is eighteen hundred, about eighteen hundred. <coughs> the stipend is two thousand five hundred and seventy-nine dollars. Okay. So they're asking us to pay two thousand five hundred and seventy-nine dollars. Plus benefits. Plus benefits. So, 
So we, we, I think we have options. We can say, raise the $2,579. Which and means have we your, have to go through the process that I was just explaining, like the NFA crew team did. On June 26, by resolution, we gave them the authorization to create a 5013C non-for-profit organization for the purpose of raising $50,000 to be a team. And we said, you will be a team, but you have to show us that you have the money by the January meeting. So now we're going to accept this donation from a non-for-profit organization, and they're going to run it as it was run by the district, only they zero dollars from the district. We cut the team. Zero contribution whatsoever from Newburgh and Large City School District. They did all of the fundraising. So yes, so that's one option. They can, and that's what I, I'm putting on the table here, the board creates a resolution, gives them authorization. They can raise 2583, whatever she just said, to pay that stipend and be a, a team, an official fencing team. What other options do you see, Mr. Lawson? Well, I, I, I don't know. I mean, because again, I'm going from the very point that we, they never asked us for anything other than the stipend. Mm -hmm. So they raised all of the money somehow before, purchased all of their stuff mm -hmm. somehow before. Mm -hmm. And I don't, I guess, I, I guess, because 2500 is not that big of a, that's not 53000 Right. So I don't know whether we should have to, or they should have to go through the 501c3 process to get the $2,500 to be able to have their, their, their fencing thing. Marco, how else legally could they donate the money? Would, do they not, is, is what he's saying correct, that because it's $2,500, can they just do that and make a donation from, I don't know, the Fencing Booster Club, I don't know. <laughs> um, they could raise, they could, they could, you know, get funds and make a, write a check to the to the district and say, would you accept this to pay for the cost of, or for the purpose of reestablishing the fencing team? In order for donations to be tax deductible, it has to be a not-for-profit entity. Um, so that's really it. And then the question is, they have they have um, events. Um, they they have to you know provide that to the athletic director and um, basically raise the money for whatever else goes along with the team in terms of, you know, transportation, going to, to right. competitions. So there's there are probably the more club. more costs, but you know, we're not aware of what they are. So so can we say this is you know, whatever it costs, the district has no obligation. If you want to do because because I heard them say, just give us let us let us have our team back. Or let us but, but have our club back. The and and they and and I correct me if I'm wrong, if you didn't hear this. I thought that they were saying, we will pay for it. We are not asking anything. All we, do, all we want is our team back. Now, if that's what they were saying, I would like to try to give them that opportunity. Now, if, if, if you are going to do that and they have to raise the funds, what the commissioner has said, if it's not in the budget, the money has to be given to the district prior to the season. So that all of it has to be given to the district before the season starts. Then I, I would like to give them that opportunity. So then you also have to, we have to decide, or somebody has to decide, is this yes. a fencing club or is it a fencing team? Because if it's a fencing team, the kids come under different uh, rules if, if it's going to be a team. But if, if, if they've got to go to a fence. would have been happy you know, to have a club. Right. So Let them have they, a club. That's fine. I don't have a problem with them having a club. But I thought you had a problem with them having a club. <laughs> if we're going to have a club, and you, you pay them the club fee, okay. not, not, a, not a, a, a coaching fee. Mary Ellen. Um, the, the parties that disagreed to the $253 stipend for a fencing club was the Newburgh Teachers Association. So they would not agree to, um, and it says right here, the fencing club, we're going to pay them $2,500. Uh, Mr. Clifton will not agree to the fencing club being paid $253. This would have to go back to being negotiated. And, and then why why did we go from a club, uh, of, a, of an advisor for a club, being put up to $2,500? When, when you don't see any tournaments, you don't see any, 
Right. I don't, I don't know how we got Where there. do you practice? Is it even practice on, on campus? Which I had heard that it wasn't. It was practiced up at, I don't know, Bard or something like that. Mm -hmm. That That's a club. That's not a, that's not a team. Mm -hmm. If it's a club, it should be a stipend for a club. But that's, unfortunately, that's not what's in the contract. Well, so that's 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 issue. what caught my eye last year when we were going over this. Right. Right. And I, you know, I'm And not, I have nothing against fencing. I fenced when I was in college, but... I'm not, di I'm not disagreeing with you, but the fact you, is I don't that once your sword you had. <laughs> <laughs> Watch out. Don't give her a sword. <laughs> I, no, no. I'm, and I'm not disagreeing with you, Ms. Prokash. What I'm saying is, if it's in the contract, the only way to change the amount is to negotiate that out. So the fact is, as it stands now, they can be a club, and we're obligated for this 25 whatever and Mr. Lawson saying if that's the case and this group is saying they want to donate 25.83 that can we give them the opportunity to do that so because yours is another issue which I, I agree with but the fact of the matter is the only way to get out change that is to negotiate that right but you did not include that stipend in the budget right we did not right so we included two hundred fifty three dollars right Right, which means they could probably raise a little bit less than twenty five hundred eighty three yes. minus two fifty three mm -hmm. plus benefits. <laughs> Plus benefits. He keeps adding that. No one's listening. He keeps adding benefits. Yeah. 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 Workers' comp, retirement expense, and flight All right. So can you come up with an amount that yeah. they have to raise to donate to the district? And they're going to then stay a club. We don't have to make them a team. They'll stay a club. But that's going to be the statement attached to it because that's what's in the contract. What may have happened is because of the point of the, the, the club, not only is there a distinction with the amount of the stipend that should be paid for a club versus team, but maybe they kept it as a club for all the other reasons why there's a distinction between a club and a team. And so they writ, they wrote, somebody made a deal somewhere. Yep. <laughs> Down the line, somebody made a deal. <laughs> <laughs> I think I got it now. <laughs> and it was made a long time, time ago. Time is three of us are here. <laughs> Okay, so Marco, what do we have to do with the fencing people? Because it was actually a group of students who came with the petition and all this information. How do we let them know that they can do whatever they want to do to raise the money? We have to have the money by such and such a date. When does the spring sports season start, uh, Mrs. Lima? March, <laughs> March, March. So, you know, so we have to have the money in hand at the February meeting. Um, and is it a spring or is it all year? It oh, I don't know. It was a club all year. Oh, it was a club all year? I think so. So we need to get the money as soon as possible if they want to start doing fencing club stuff. And if you're going to do that, you can prorate it from that point on. Wouldn't have to be twenty five hundred. It's only going to be half a year. Fourteen fifty. So, so Mr. Pasella and Mrs. Limer, can you get that prorated number, or whatever? Say if it were to start, I don't know. Pick a date <laughs> so that they could raise the money. Okay. And so there's a, there's also a difference in the way we pay pay club stipends and the way we pay team stipends. Clubs are paid at the beginning of the year. year. <laughs> Teams are paid at the end of the season. And a lump sum. What All right, so they in the get past, this was paid yearly. It was divvied up into 26 checks. Oh, and they got a little bit. So even better. So they need even less. So that's how it has been paid in the past. I still think we should do what you're saying. I don't think that we should start the season because then what happens if they don't raise the money, then we have to stop it. I, I think we should say. Whatever that number is, mm -hmm. there's a rated number. 3210 <coughs> has to be raised by the beginning of the spring sports Tomorrow season. Tomorrow morning. <laughs> okay. Um, and, and you're a club. But, right, but why, get, why, why have 3210 there when 
they mm-hmm. haven't been a club for all this time. You see, they're losing all that time. <coughs> the 32-10 would be for a full year. So how is that fair to ask them for 32-10 when they're only going to be a club from, say, March 1st to June 30th? But is that the season for? No, them? apparently, no. because it was a club, no, it was September. It has no That's a question. We paid it from September to June. I have no idea what they did and when they did. That's a right. question to and ask. And 3210 includes benefits? Yes. yes. Oh, okay. Well, <laughs> but firstly, why could it be a 12-month period starting when they raise it, number one? And so why does it have to be from September to June? Because of insurance. And not, not only that, but team. for the, for, for the budget team. and the financial yeah. records of the district, to have everybody on the same thing. Sure. Mel, didn't, uh, doesn't every club supposed to submit something to you? Yes. Uh, they need to submit their bylaws, right. how many kids they anticipate, what their meeting schedule would be, that kind of thing. I can look through what I've collected over either this year, they may not have submitted anything this year, Probably last year. or last year mm-hmm. to see what they said. And you would yeah. have a better uh, understanding. Okay. All right, so let's collect all this information so that we can contact them and let them know how they can do this. <laughs> All right, let's take consensus that we want to allow the fencing club to be a fencing club under the condition that they will raise $3,210 to cover the stipend and insurances and benefits and whatever that stuff is. Okay. Minus the $215? Minus $253, which is the only thing that's in the budget. Mrs. Matthew. Yes. Mr. Howard. Yes. Mr. Levenstein. Yes. Ms. Resch. Yes. Mr. Woodhull. Yes. Mr. Lawson. Yes. Ms. Prokash. Yes. Yes. Oh, that. Okay. Somebody should be in touch with Dominic Devano. I think that before the end, I need some information. Okay. So, Mr. Pasella or Mrs. Limer, right, Mr. Pizzo? They or Mr. Major. Or Mr. Major, oh, whatever. You yeah. guys figure out who's going to do that. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> the 250 <laughs> is not budgeted for fencing. The 250 is a line item under club for any club that gets approved. Right. So, there was so we would be approving right. a club, though. No, I get that, but it's not 3210 minus 250, because the 250 is set aside for any club. <laughs> It wasn't 250 set aside for fencing club because, as my understanding, it wasn't going to be a fencing club. Oh, okay. so technically the 250 set aside. So the 250 wasn't in there. So moving, so moving forward during budget discussions, and we would have to decide whether there was going to be 253 in there for the fencing club. You, when, you, when you build the budget, you, we build a total pot for Schedule J, which this falls under. It's really not listed by club because you generally in March, in February and March, you don't know what clubs are going to be for next year. So just the, the contract amount that's negotiated is 253 for a club that gets approved by you eventually. That you may have additional clubs or you could have different clubs. additional clubs. Or less. You could have less, or less clubs. Some don't run it from year to year. But mm-hmm. when we were doing this, it was decided that if they wanted to run, they would run as a club and would come out of this general pot. So I, I'm still confused. So they share the 250. If say four clubs pop up, they share the 250. No, no, no. no. Each, each, each advisor gets 250. So it's still the same thing. I, I don't understand why it's different from what she said. Because if if we if we approve it, they would be able to deduct the 250, wouldn't they? We, we would approved, we would pay down the 250. We approved the amount of Schedule J based on the clubs that are currently running in your budget development. Okay, there was no fencing stipend when, during that budget development for 253. Right. I got you. So, all right. So, Are there any so for this in year, a prorated number, we wouldn't subtract 253 because that isn't in there. But for the budget process coming up, if that's going to be in place, then the discussion is: Are we putting back a 253 club? In case fencing wants to be no. the, the 253 for fencing needs to be negotiated with right, the NDA. Because okay. Because All right. So the there's nothing going in for 253, and they have right. to raise 3210. Okay. Okay. Got it. You put a wrinkle in me. You said minus the 250. I just, I just want to reassure Mr. Lawson. 
if for any reason this doesn't work, that you could suggest to the young man who presented at the board meeting last month that, that he might try for the debate club. Because we were all so extremely impressed with him. Yeah. Very and, yeah. I don't know whether he's any good at fencing or not. But he is. Probably the debater. I'm sorry, I missed it. She doesn't have any equipment. Okay. All right. So more information coming. All right. Your last item. item well, oh, no, yeah, that's right. You got it. Item asked a resolution to accept the bills and reports. There's two items that need to be um, added, and they were as a side. Item G will be a resolution uh, to finalize a race for the school year 11 12 for non resident pupils attending ed programs within the school district. So these are the rates they usually typically get adjusted by the state you know, in January following the year. And item H is the uh, Resolution to revise the tuition rates for the school, the current school year 2012 2013, for resident pupils attending our programs here in the district. And that concludes my item. <laughs> <laughs> oh, one item wasn't mine. Right. <laughs> I threw that in there because it was all about people donating money, and I'm like, we got to talk about the I've been thinking about them and their eloquent speech, and I'm like, we got to get back to them. Thank you, Mr. Okay. The next item on the agenda is from the Assistant Superintendent for Human Resources. Thank you, Madam President. On the Human Resources agenda, items A through J, we have on the professional side appointments, home teacher appointments, change of location, leave of absence resignation and retirements and on the civil service side we have appointments change of status change of location retirements and both former and current employees Resolution K is a resolution for professional change of status. Most of these are the long-term subs who have now been in or will be shortly in for a semester or longer and need to be contacted. So, question is, uh, well, on this, does, when it says replacing, those people that are they're replacing are out on long-term yes. illnesses or? Yes, or illnesses or childcare. <coughs> <coughs> These names came from the uh, long term. The, the names. <laughs> Which names, Mr. Howard? These uh, seven names. They, they were. They were all working, working as per diem subs. Per diem subs. Yes, and now because they've been in for the length of time they've been in, we have to put them on a contract. And that first one is recall. It's a recall. Right. Resolution L is to approve after school because after school program appointments. These are some additional folks working in Horizons after school program and Disney Avenue's mm -hmm. early morning program. Resolution M is to amend the contract agreement we had with um, the individual who came in as a consultant in um, the pre-K special ed area. Um, in order for her to complete her work, she needed to work approximately five or six days longer than we had originally anticipated. Mr. Pizzo and I were made aware of this. 
he authorized it, this, this gives us the authority to pay her that additional fee. <laughs> Resolution N is to approve the spring coaching appointments. Um, Ms. Prokash asked me to get information from Mr. Major about how many interviews he did and for which sports. He's compiling that. That will be in the update on Friday. I have a question about the, 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 the strength coach is what? What, what is that position? That's okay. strength coach. Oh, I can answer that. The strength <laughs> coach is the, is the coach that goes into the, um, the this new facility up there, the oversees the, the um, boys and girls who use the equipment okay. for the, you know, so that they have someone that is competent to, you know, so they're just not going in their own or they're just not going in with um, a coach, another coach. He's in there to um, to manage it and to help the students uh, use, so the machines hurt, correctly, use the machines yeah. correctly. Because up in the weight room, it's mostly weight free weights. And, you know, you can get hurt on free weights if you're not doing it the right way. So he's in there uh, during different times advising. after school, advising and working up sometimes um, like an extra time routine, you know, kind of how to do it. Yeah, I, I just wanted to, you know, invite the board to consider something. because. Strength and conditioning is really something that is important for, I mean, for athletics. And it can extend beyond just actually the student athletes. Um, and I, I'd like us to consider maybe looking at someone who can really develop a, a routine year round program. So, you know. Well, like I was, have an athletic trainer on staff. I, you know, I, I'm looking at the, the, the track coach because I was just so impressed with. Um, you know, we were at this dinner with um, Samir. Samir, and it's like, I hear tell that there's a lot of our, our athletes on the track team that go on get athletic scholarships, probably the most of any other sport. So I, I, I mean, I would like for us to consider having a real true strength and conditioning person in that position to really, you know, train the kids and teach them about conditioning, teach them about diet, and teach them. Have it, have it be something really, because uh, because what I understand from the, the from my works is he already actually always does all of this stuff. He actually already can trains the kids year round, and and that's why I guess the track athletes do so well. So I just want us to consider maybe looking at it from a, from more than just the weight room aspect of it, because he can do that as well. But looking at it from well, how can I train these kids to really condition these kids and help them become better athletes, not just our athletes that are students, but also all of the students. Well, I think they, that room was also used during the physical education classes. It's, it's, now, yeah. right, it's now a station. So, so it's now a station. Okay. Right. So they, you know. Right. And then, and I, correct me if I'm wrong, don't they need a certain certification to be a strength I believe, coach? I believe they do. Um, they so, you know. you know, and the way, you know, the way it was done in the past was uh, not, efficient or appropriate so um when we got this new weight room and everything the board really looked at you know hey is somebody going to be there we want to see a schedule of when they're going to be there and are they certified so that the purpose that we're paying this money is so that someone who knows how to train yeah. is actually working with these kids instead of them just walking in whenever they feel like it or a coach that doesn't necessarily know what they're doing with the equipment. He's very good too. Just in one. there standing there watching them and the kids are doing whatever. You know. So Mr. Howard. So uh, based on what you just said, did we was that put into consideration when we did make this choice, number one. Number two, I think what Mr. Uh, Lawson was saying is an excellent idea because what it does, if you get someone in there who's trained and tr actually training athletes, you know, it only benefits our athletic programs at Newburgh because I think one of the things he didn't say when he was trying, when, when he meant to say was this sport specific workout for each sport that enhances an athlete, athlete's ability mm -hmm. to be um, 
excelling at his own sport. I mean, it's different. You got somebody just sitting there babysitting, you know, right. watching the guys right. Right. as opposed to someone exactly. in there putting programs, sports mm -hmm. specific programs together, which only benefits our Newburgh athletes. Mm -hmm. I agree. So, yes, that was looked because I believe um, because Mr. Bianco um, is the coach for the varsity football team, um, that was one of the reasons that he was selected <coughs> because he had this background <coughs> training certification. Um, as far as, you know. I know the girls' basketball team used it this year, this winter, and they're still using it. And you it. put programs together for them? Mm -hmm. Yes. Okay. No, I, I, again, I just wanted to, you know, the fact that a lot of our track student athletes go on to get scholarships, you know, and then we had to think, and, and it just came to me when I was, when I saw Samir just excel, an Olympic athlete, mm -hmm. and he, he, he gave a lot of credit to Mr. Burks. Yes, I'm like, he trained an Olympic athlete. So, you know, it just no brainer for me to see, wow, why not see what he can do with this? And I just wanted us to consider that. But it sounds like you, Mr. Bianco. And a lot of times the coaches go in with their athletes too within there. Okay. Right. So, so your they're, coach they're, is yeah, there with the strength you know, coach. Right. You know. Right. It's done in tandem many times. And, you know, and I don't know, um, have we seen the schedule yet, Mary Ellen, do you know, from Mr. Major? Because I remember asking about that specifically so that people, they had to change the key lock system and everything because they had people just going in there and using the equipment whenever, and yeah. that's liability. Um, so I know they changed that, but we asked for um, a schedule for the strength coach, again, to avoid what was done in the past where someone was getting paid a stipend and was never there. So we're like, why are we spending, you know, $6,000 a year and the purse, there's nobody there watching these kids and do, you know, do like you're saying, doing a program right. with these kids to help, you know, to help all students because that room is open to all students. Okay. So, um, so well, I haven't seen it. Okay. okay. And then, you know, I don't know what, what um, role um, our athletic trainer plays, but, um, you know, obviously he travels a lot, um, you know, with the um, athletes in particular, obviously the football players, but also soccer, and baseball, that's basketball, that's um, you know, a lot of Sometimes he'll give a kid that that's hurt or injured a program to follow mm -hmm. when they go into, into, the, weight in, into the weight room to, you know, work on certain things. And, he also works for a physical therapist. So again, there's another qualified um, staff member of the district to work on um, specific programs for you know overall training. So there's a specific certification to be the strength coach. I believe so. High school. Yeah, there is. Okay. Yes. And then if we, I guess if we get the donation set and the resolution gets approved for the acceptance of the money for the crew team, then Mr. Major will have to do, and that'll have to be posted and he'll have to do interviews or actually it was probably already posted. I posted it as they anticipated. Okay. Get it rolling. Okay. So it's been posted. Okay. Very good. Mm -hmm. Uh, resolution O is to create two temporary positions, one the program facilita facilitator for school improvement and the other an instructional post. These are the two, pro two positions that came, that were incorporated into the school innovation fund grant for Temple Hill Academy and the job descriptions are attached. Resolution B is to create a part-time account clerk position <coughs> that will be split between the payroll department and the tax office. Um, and there's no effect on the general fund. We had a retirement and an anticipated vacancy that's not going to be filled. Resolution Q is to authorize the superintendent of schools to execute a supplemental memorandum of agreement with CSEA. The um, MOA is attached. This is to establish summer school rates, extended school year program rates for the different positions that um, we have in 
the CFTA bargaining unit. Of course, we have established rates for teachers who work in the extended school year. We wanted to establish those rates for those titles in um, the uh, civil service um, CFTA. We, um, in the past, had paid them whatever they were making during the year. Even if they were not working in that capacity during summer school. So for example, you could easily have a cook <coughs> working as an aide and I was paying the cook salary as she worked as an aide, which was substantially higher than what we would pay at an aide. So, um, they agreed to establish these um, summer school rates. Um, there is a, a paragraph in here where we will go back and look at the work done this past summer because I, I initiated these rates. I jumped the gun. And um, we now have to go back and pay the difference. Um, but going forward, we'll be paying these new rates. So the union already endorsed it. Um, we're looking for the, um, the board's approval. Mm -hmm. Resolution R is to authorize the superintendent of schools to execute a supplemental memorandum of agreement with the NTA. This is to establish the club Girls to Ladies as a program. Um, not as a club. This is a program run um, at Heritage for young ladies um, who may be struggling in a lot of different capacities, academic, social, whatever, but under the extracurricular uh, policy, they were prohibited from attending the club meetings because some of them have attendance issues. So we were defeating the purpose of the club so um, we approached the NTA to um, continue to pay the advisors the 253 stipend, but to call it a program, not a club. Check that off the list, Mr. Lawson. <laughs> Is there a similar uh, boys club? In, in yeah, but I don't believe this year there is. There may have been in the past. Uh, I don't think there's anything active this year. Not in the last couple of years. No. What was the name of it, Sue? Boys to Men. They had it. Um, That's the same group, you know that. Yes. <laughs> <laughs> That's how you spell it. They're trying to expand the year. But they haven't had it the last few years. So. Yeah. I, you really want to. <laughs> <laughs> so I just, just I don't know. There's no Title IX going the opposite way, right? <laughs> no, no, there can be, but this is not athletics. It's only with athletics? Title IX really deals with, with uh, okay. gender and athletics. Uh, th there had been, <coughs> I remember when we met with this group um, a couple of years yeah, last year, before, and there had been a boys to men club, but I, I don't know whatever, what happened to it over the last several years. But hadn't been. The girls to the girls to ladies was really relatively new. Right. Yes. Boys to men was there for a long time, right. and then finally girls to ladies. And then we had the issue with the conflict with the policy. So we're like, how can we work this out? Because it's great for these particular students. And so then Mrs. Limer was able to work with the NTA and and get very good advisors. Very nice. They were doing Resolution S is to authorize the superintendent of schools to execute a settlement agreement with employee 3531. The settlement agreement is attached. Um, this was originally brought forth as a grievance for the district's failure to provide adequate preparation time for the teacher involved. Um, and this settles that grievance by compensating that teacher for the time lost, the lost preparation time. Does this end up, Mary 
gentleman at stage, did this end up at stage three no. of the grievance committee? No. no. So this is what was negotiated before that. I was a stage two here. hearing officer, and it was, it's been going on for a while, but we offered this as a settlement, and um, the NTA agreed to the settlement. And it withdraws the grievance Um Resolution T is to authorize the superintendent of schools to execute an agreement with employee 3740. This needs further discussion in executive session. Resolution U is to adopt the 1314 <coughs> calendar. There is a new calendar on the table this evening, a revised one. It's not a major revision. Um, the, we got updated regents examination dates from the state in June. Um, we had originally had the regents dates of June 10th through the 20th. They have been revised <coughs> to, to June the 17th through June the 25th. So it doesn't change the last day of school or anything like that. It just rearranges when the um, regents will be administered next June. <laughs> Everything else remains the same. And we, just so you know, um, the committee worked really hard on, um, in the years past, we've had some issues with the um, Jewish holidays and when they begin and, and athletic events and all that stuff. So they work diligently, as they always do. And I, I don't think we're going to have any of those issues this year. I think we're closed when we need to be closed and we're not having any activities in the buildings. Um, on you know when those sundown um, holidays begin and um, so that's noted on September 15th. Um, it's for young people, I believe. Um, it's on a Saturday, so the district is enclosed for it, but we shouldn't be having activities after sundown on the 13th. Right. So, Mr. Pizzo asked that it be specifically included in this calendar this year, so everyone's on notice that they need to comply with that. Yes, Ms. Levinson. Uh, in reference to the regents' exams ending the 25th, mm -hmm. which it was later than the <coughs> first plan, is that later than what it was this year? Well, my concern is how late it is in June when people are, are, are not going to know if they're going to graduate. Is that going to be? We always have a Regents exam, generally, either sometimes on the day of graduation, mm -hmm. but always the day before graduation. They are scoring like mad right. up there to the very last minute to kids, see if these kids can walk. Down. But okay, so the original thing was a week earlier. Right. right? Would you give you a nice cushion. Right. But we don't have any control. <laughs> uh, resolution B is to approve the tenure recommendation for the teacher. Resolution W is for your information only. It's upcoming tenure recommendations for a teacher and a administrator. And I have an additional item, um, Resolution X, that we need to go into the executive